Today on Monkey Life, Alison and wildlife vet John Lewis visit the park's sister sanctuary in Vietnam. I always love coming back. It's like my Vietnamese family. Marina and Alison inspect a possible new home for golden-cheeked gibbons Nar and Coochie. I think it would work well between both organizations. Yes, yeah, thank you. And John battles the heat to give slow Loris Batman the snip. Job done, really. <laughs> This is Dao Tien Rescue Center in Vietnam. It's the sister sanctuary of Monkey World in Dorset, and the staff here dedicate their lives to rescuing and rehabilitating endangered Vietnamese primates. It's a new forest with a new family group of gibbons coming, and hopefully everybody will grow up and mature together. It's a 6,000-mile journey from the UK to the center, which lies 160 miles northeast of Ho Chi Minh City. Away from the hustle and bustle of the major towns and cities of Vietnam is a country steeped in tradition. With a population of over 90 million to feed, it's no wonder agriculture plays a huge part in its economy. But in recent times, tourism is starting to play a significant role too. With over 30 national parks and six biosphere reserves that are recognized by UNESCO, the conservation of wildlife within these areas is becoming a priority for the Vietnamese government. And Dao Tien plays no small part in protecting some of the country's most endangered species. Set up in 2008, with the full support and cooperation of the authorities, it's a 56-hectare island in the Dong Nai province. Alison makes frequent visits to the centre, and this time she's brought vet John Lewis with her. For Alison, it's always uplifting to return to the island that is so close to her heart. The team here on Dao Tien are fantastic, and I always love coming back. It's like my Vietnamese family, and it's the beginning of what's going to be a very intense three or four days trying to achieve as much as possible while we're here to help out Marina, Lee, and their team who live here and work here diligently every day of the year. Since Dao Tien opened, the team have rescued more than 100 primates, including golden-cheeked gibbons, black-shanked duklangas, and more recently, pygmy loris, a small nocturnal primate. But unlike Monkey World, the role here at Dao Tien is to rescue, rehabilitate, and then release the primates back into the wild. The idea is that any animals not able to be released will be found a suitable home, freeing up space for other individuals who can be released. Marina Kenyon runs the center with her partner, Lee. This is the core of Dao Tien. We're in the center of the island. And this is our phase one area for gibbons. So we have at the moment over 20 gibbons here. This is where they come in, they do quarantine, we try to get them healthy, and most importantly, we give them gibbon friends. The phase one gibbons are health checked and assessed over a period of time. If they're deemed suitable and have been paired up, they can then progress to the semi-free forested areas on Dao Tien. There are four on the island, the largest almost 20 hectares, and it's here that the gibbons can start to build up their tree strength, getting used to swinging through the forest once again. Gibbons are um, like magical creatures. They're like the ballerinas of the, of the treetops. They move so quietly. If you're lucky enough to be in the forest at sunrise and they sing, they do this like super hyper-metallic call. It's such a privilege to, for me to work in a forest with gibbons. And without them, it's a huge loss. So we have to work and try our best to keep them here. And it's very simple. We, humans, just need to leave them alone. Not all of Dao Tien's gibbons make it back to the wild, however. 
Nar is a male gibbon who's been at the center since the very beginning. He did make it into the semi-wild area, but the transition was problematic. The biggest problem with Nar he, is that he's fearless. He's not afraid of humans. And as gibbons grow up, they get enormous canines, so he's actually quite dangerous. He would quite happily bite you if he had the opportunity. He'd be very sorry about it afterwards, but damage will already be done. Along with his partner, Ku Chi, he's not suitable for release. A permanent home will have to be found for the pair. We're full here to capacity. We've said we can't take any more gibbons here until we relocate some of our unsuitable for release individuals, and we're sort of trying to stick to that as best we can. But in the meantime, Na is about to undergo a minor operation. I would get that free med into him now. then yeah. now. He's going to be castrated. This is primarily to stop Na and Kuchi breeding, but the team also hope it might calm the feisty male down. While John preps for the operation, Na has already been given a pre-med to make him drowsy. It's a bit of a waiting game for the team, and so far the drug is showing little sign of affecting Na. John will have to anaesthetise him the old-fashioned way. No change of plan, and no change in the given that's had the pre-med either. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and dart him. Darting a fast-moving gibbon, even in a small enclosure, is no easy feat. But John knows from experience it's all about picking your moment. And as soon as Nas' back is turned, he takes the shot. <laughs> it takes a few minutes for the drug to take effect. Nas is wobbly, but still clinging on up high in his cage. Lee is ready with the net to catch him, while John unhooks Nar's fingers from the mesh. You ready? Okay. Nice one. Once John has checked him over, Nar is quickly transported to the center's hospital. John needs to work fast. Giving primates anaesthetic is never straightforward and in hot and humid conditions can be quite challenging for the vet team and the animal. Well, we get another fan on him anyway and then have the bucket of cold water ready and I'll try and be relatively quick. Keeping a primate's body temperature stable throughout an operation is vital. The biggest anaesthetic risk we take really is temperature. And if they can't, if they can't control their temperature, there's the risk that the body temperature will rise and rise and rise above what is acceptable. I need you to watch the breathing at all times. For John, this is normally a straightforward procedure, but the heat and humidity have made this operation far from comfortable. With Na being closely monitored, John locates his testes. With a snip and a couple of stitches, the operation is complete. It's not particularly painful. He'll be on painkillers anyway, which is not because I think it's hurting him, especially, it's because I don't want him fiddling with the surgical site. There's nothing more we need to do, and hopefully that'll calm him down. And um, that's the end of the story. The operation went well, and once Nar is fully recovered from the anaesthetic, he can be returned to his enclosure. Na and his mate Kuchi may not have to wait long for a new, more permanent home. After months of research, Marina thinks she's found the perfect place for the pair to live. And she's travelled with Alison over to the mainland to check it out. Hello. Hello. Sin Chao. Hello. Hello. You too. The Mango Garden Wildlife Centre has been running for a couple of years and looks after and cares for a number of exotic animals and birds from around the world. Marina has been consulting with them for the last few months and the centre now has space to take in up to three pairs of gibbons from Dautien. 
Uh, this is just fantastic because after so many years, if we can find a solution for those guys that can't go back out to the wild, it would be a godsend at this point. If all goes well, this will free up vital space on Dao Tien for the team to take in more gibbons that need rescuing, who can hopefully be released into the forested areas of Vietnam. I think it would work well between both organizations. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Marina has already made recommendations on how to fit out the enclosures with hoses and ropes, so the gibbons will be able to swing and travel high up off the ground, just like in the wild. And what would your time frame be on this? Well, when you say you are ready, we can, we can come. So we just come one week before to prepare the internal, once the mesh is all good, and then, then the gibbons come. All good, Thank you. I think. The arrivals from Dao Tien will be phased in a pair at a time, although they won't be the first gibbons living at this center. Hey, you guys. Let's see you, mister. It's a male and a female, the pileated gibbon, the male. If we get a chance to see him, he's just leapt to the tree behind, is actually from Cambodia. It's a species that comes only from Cambodia. So, um, it's a little bit of an odd pairing, but at least they're together and being social and they seem to like each other. So far, everything is looking good. It's just what Alison was hoping for. This visit today has far-reaching effects, not just for the gibbons we're talking about, but for others that we don't even know about yet. And wow, amazing, big, beautiful cages. Really important that this works out, and I'm so pleased to see how wonderful it is. So, got everything crossed that this is going to go ahead. The gibbons on Dao Tien need constant care and attention. Every aspect of their life, including their diet, is closely monitored by the team until a decision is made on whether they're suitable for release. And it's not just the phase one primates in the assessment enclosures that need looking after. Yeah, you go see. In the four semi-free forested areas on the island, the gibbons have their food supplemented. There aren't enough of the correct fruiting trees to support them all year round. This morning, keeper Kawai is feeding golden cheat gibbons, limwin and misu in the larger 20 hectare site. They're now successful parents of two infants, Savi and Tai. But just three years ago, before they had their babies, they were released into a forested area in Kat Tien National Park, where a large wild male gibbon heard them and attacked limwin. He wasn't a match in size or attitude and couldn't protect himself. The team managed to retrieve the pair and since then, Limwin has developed into a big solid male and the pair's bond has grown. They're a wonderful family and they behave like wild gibbons. Um, they travel well in the forest. So they're pretty much ready now to go full release. Um, we're just working on finding the right area, the right level of protection um, and the right um, tree species there. Golden cheat gibbons aren't the only primates Dao Tien have successfully rehabilitated and released back into the wild. In the last few years, more than 30 lorises have gone back to the forests of Vietnam. In a short space of time, Dao Tien has now been recognized internationally as one of the world's premier rescue and release centers for this small nocturnal species. We're learning things all of the time. What type of habitat to release in, what time of year to release in, which individuals make good candidates. And it's been a bit of trial and error. We've had losses, there's no doubt about it, but sometimes the individuals that you lose, if you're following them and taking honest, realistic data from them, you learn more from this negative information in order to prepare the next batch. So you have to take the rough with the smooth. And rescued lorises keep on coming to the island, almost all from the pet trade. They've been stolen from the wild and then confiscated by authorities who are getting tough on illegal traders. 
Being asked to rehabilitate so many lorises has led to Doughty N building a brand new complex to house them all. There's a lot more space for the animals, so we've actually increased their area. And for when we work, because we've designed it this way, we have a bigger working area, so it's a lot more relaxed. And it has worked with the lorries are a lot calmer here compared to the old house. Um, so yeah, it's working well. With so many lorises to feed and look after, the team are constantly thinking and devising new ways of enrichment to keep them more active through the night. So this is the feeder. As you can see, we've got three holes, and off each hole we have two channels. The plan is put the insect in, close the lid, that then just stops the cricket jumping out. But hopefully, with these tunnels, the crickets will come out, and hopefully it's a slow release. You know, they'll come onto the log. It's not directly there into the leaf. It's just a different aspect to try and get the lorries to, to work for their food. Naturally, in the wild, they're going to see a cricket. They're not always going to get it. In captivity, it's there, it's on a plate. More than likely, they're always going to eat that. So we actually have to control the amount we feed. Not all rescue lorises that come to Doughty End will make it back into the wild. One such pair are Batman and Hope. Hope is the female half of the partnership, and she arrived on the island already pregnant. She's since given birth to twins, and Batman has taken all three under his wing. Batman and Hope are two loris that have been long-term in captivity before they even came to us, and then they've been here for a wee while as well. So they're really not suitable for release. They need to be fit and healthy, yes, but they also need to be mentally prepared. And we're not convinced that Batman and Hope have that in them. They're going to remain here at Doughty N, but in the new semi-wild Loris area, where they can spend their days and nights up in the treetops. But before that, Batman has to undergo a minor surgical procedure. He needs a vasectomy. While the team are happy to keep the pair in the semi-wild, they don't want any more babies to look after. Space is at a premium here on the island, and it's vital there's room for the constant flow of rescued lorises coming in from the mainland. It's a first for John. He's performed vasectomies on tiny primates such as marmosets, but never a loris. The size of the animal and the hot and humid conditions he's going to have to work in could prove quite a challenge. If I'd done a thousand loris, I could probably cut the skin and go straight to the vas. I haven't done any loris actually. So you have to dissect your way around the area under which you've cut to locate the vas, and that's a bit more fiddly. With Batman anaesthetized, John gets to work. But it's not easy, and locating the tiny vessel to make a cut is taking time. There are so many tiny veins and tubes, it's hard to differentiate between them all. That feels like a vast to me. At last, John locates the correct one. Because it has a very muscular wall, it's rather rubbery. Now, the decision now is whether we tie off both ends of it or not. He ties the tube in two places and then severs between the ties. Next, he needs to repeat the procedure on the other side. But now he knows what he's looking for, it's a lot quicker. Job done, really. <laughs> and I think with chops like that, what you really want to do is another one. No, not now, tomorrow morning because what you've learned on that, hopefully you can make the next job more efficient and quicker, because um, it may be another N years before we get to do another Loris. Batman is given 24 hours to recover from the operation. The following evening, Lee prepares to move the whole family from the new Loris complex to the semi-wild area. Post-op, he's looking very well. Um, myself, Alison and John had a very good look at him today. Um, so we're all happy. Um, so, yeah, so this is why we're, we're doing the move now. They'll be put into a holding cage in the middle of the semi-wild forested area for at least 24 hours. There, they'll be able to get accustomed to the sight, sounds and smells of their new home. 
It's easier to move the lorises while there's still a bit of daylight and they're still sleepy. Lorises are nocturnal animals and won't come fully active until it's dark. Lee releases Hope and her two babies first. Still clinging to Mum, all three head up into the branches and leaf shelter of the holding cage. On the other side. Batman doesn't put up much of a fight either. Perhaps he's anxious to be reunited with his family. Yes, looked OK. Or still feeling sorry for himself following his operation. There he goes. But Lee soon has him in the semi-wild area with Hope and the two youngsters. They look OK, but the one thing we need to do now is we need to go away because they are going to be stressed, being handled. Very stressful for any primate, especially Loris. So we better quick check. They're all good. So what we'll do now, we'll move away. I'll speak to the guy who's working with them tonight and we'll just do regular checks throughout the evening. While Batman and Hope will be living permanently in the semi-wild area at Doughty N, Alison is determined it will be a very different outcome for the pair's offspring. It's been said by other organisations that it's not possible to release loris that are born in captivity, and that it's a little bit like a red flag to a bull around here, because if those babies survive in our semi-wild and reach maturity, we will try and release them back out into the wild because they will have grown up effectively in a semi-wild habitat and we're going to see if we can break the cliché that a captive-born loris cannot be rehabilitated back out into the wild. With the help and cooperation of the authorities and the hard work and dedication of the whole team at Doughty N, the future of this small species is starting to look a whole lot brighter. Next time on Monkey Life. A territorial wild gibbon is on the attack as Alison and the team attempt to carry out health checks on a group of rescued gibbons. OK, can we let this other gibbon through into the other enclosure? And baby gibbon Locke finds comfort in the arms of adopted brother Dwayne. <laughs>